podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. All right, I'd like to join other speakers in thanking the organizers for organizing this conference in such an elegant venue. So I'm going to continue where Andreas left off uh, and try to describe uh, some new techniques coming out of holography to describe finite density states in quantum field theory using string theory techniques. Uh, I'll talk about work of many different people, but to the extent that I talk about my own work, it's based on collaborations with the group at TIFR, uh, Sandeep Trivedi's group and also with a number of very gifted postdocs and students at Stanford. OK, so the best way to start any physics talk is by listing some interesting physics problems. And uh, nature provides us with a host of those. Here's one from condensed matter physics. So typical metals, including those you learn about when you take junior statistical mechanics, uh, especially those that also become superconducting at low temperatures, are governed by something called Fermi liquid theory. Uh, whose justification Andreas somewhat reviewed. It's a guess based on the notion of adiabatic continuity. But the basic picture in Fermi liquid theory is that if you have a gas of fermions uh, at some finite density, then you fill up single particle fermion states. So you have particles in a box with some momentum. You fill up the higher and higher momentum states in the box until you reach some Fermi momentum. And since each momentum can only be occupied by at most two fermions, uh, you grow a sphere that's ever larger in momentum space out to some k Fermi. Now, basic quantum mechanics in a sort of single particle plus weak interactions picture, together with just the kinematics of this Fermi surface, that states within the Fermi surface are doubly occupied and hence inaccessible as intermediate states, while the states on the surface can hop up a little bit above the Fermi surface and get some extra energy, these two facts together determine robustly a lot of properties of, of the simplest metals. For instance, the, the specific heat in the regime where this is the dominant picture should be linear in T. Uh, the resistivity should go like t squared based on just Fermi's golden rule, and so forth. And maybe it's a surprise, but this works remarkably well for many metals. Now, the fixed point, which comes about when you take this picture and make it into a quantum field theory that was first done relatively late by Shankar and Polchensky and others, uh, has a Fermi liquid fixed point, which is in this terminology of the renormalization group, an infrared stable fixed point. That's not quite true. There are some marginal perturbations corresponding to the so-called Landau parameters. And in some cases, there's one marginally relevant perturbation corresponding to the Cooper channel instability generated by phonon exchange. But basically, it's, it's an infrared stable fixed point. And that's what explains its ubiquity in real world metals. And that presumably is why this picture has had so much success. But a variety of experiments starting in the 1980s and continuing with greater and greater precision till today yield phase diagrams for relatives of these simple metals that have decidedly non-Fermi liquid behavior. Whatever is governing their behavior above, say, a superconducting dome as seen in the Cooper rates, uh, it's not this picture because these exponents come out wrong. Okay, so here's a picture of actual data from a couple of years ago in a, in a heavy fermion system. The vertical axis is temperature. The horizontal axis is magnetic field. There's presumably a quantum critical point here, a point with enhanced symmetry like conformal invariance. And you see here the, the colors represent the resistivity. Blue is Fermi liquid theory resistivity. And orange is linear resistivity. So there's very convincing evidence now from experiments that there are sort of quantum critical fans in the T versus order parameter, sorry, T versus control parameter phase, uh, diagram that exhibit this non-Fermi liquid resistivity. So these materials suggest, at the broadest level, a challenge. OK, we're string theorists. None of us can even really figure out what this compound is. So the challenge is not to explain this data exactly. But the challenge is there are apparently qualitatively new infrared stable phases of matter, or almost stable phases of matter. So can we classify infrared almost stable fixed points of finite density quantum matter? Now, this is, of course, too broad and difficult a question, because we have very few tools to do this. But we do have one somewhat new tool, holography. And so 
here I'll describe some new results that come just from studies of holography at finite density motivated by this goal. Now, if you're reductive and you think our goal should be to study classical and quantum gravity using strings, then I would say reductively you can just view this as an attempt to better understand what is clearly a rich zoo of black hole and black brain solutions in string theory and their dual physics. And in fact, it is really pictures like this that have motivated the exploration and understanding of this rich structure in the last few years. Okay, so just from our selfish purposes, learning about black holes has been greatly stimulated by this interface with condensed matter physics. So to talk about this well, I have to introduce the simplest cases of holography at finite charge density. So what are the minimal ingredients you need to ask questions about things like resistivity? Um, well, finite temperature holographic matter is mapped in ADS-CFT to a charged black brain geometry. The Hawking temperature of the black brain generates the temperature. The charge is, if you want, the, the doping of, of the matter, the extra charges. And the simplest action that would support, at least from the bottom up, a holographic dictionary that would have a current whose conductivity we could compute would then be that which supports ADS, uh, an Einstein term with negative cosmological constant, uh, and one Maxwell field, whose coupling I've set this way by convention. So the first place to start is asking what are the black hole, the charged black hole solutions of this action? And these were found in the late 90s by Chamblin and collaborators. So the simplest solution is the ADS analog of the Reisner Nordstrom solution of flat space relativity. Uh, it has a line element that, if we set the function f to 1, would just be anti de Sitter space with curvature r. But there's this uh, so called emblackening factor f that tells you that, depending on the charge and mass of the hole, uh, there's a horizon uh, and there's a gauge field, an A naught which tells you the charge of the black hole. The component which falls off more slowly at infinity is the chemical potential, and the response or the charge density induced by that chemical potential is the subleading term. Now, in the case of a 4D bulk dual to a 2 plus 1 dimensional field theory, which is of interest in many cases, uh, the extremal limit, which would be the ground state of the doped theory, the place we might expect to find quantum criticality if we're going to find it anywhere, uh, has a near horizon geometry that looks like this, much simpler than this complicated metric. And in fact, if you stare at this for a second, you recognize that dx squared plus dy squared is just the metric on R2, and this is just the metric of ADS2. So the geometry in the near horizon is ADS2 times R2. Now, the failure of the R2 to shrink as you go towards the horizon means that the, you know, the area of the black hole is not shrinking. There, there's constant area, in fact, divergent area. And so there's an extensive ground state entropy. Whatever this zero temperature state is, it's very unusual. Now, there are known systems that would give an extensive ground state entropy. For instance, if you took a bunch of magnetic spins uh, that were free or have very weak interactions, then before the interaction energy is important, free spins certainly would have extensive ground state entropy. Uh, phonons above the Debye temperature could have somewhat similar physics in many ways to this. But for a strongly coupled state of matter coming out of some strongly coupled field theory, this seems very exotic. So many people have suspected, as Andreas discussed, that this is probably um, a highly idealized model of what comes out in holography. But it is the first thing we land on. And studying this in more detail, starting with the work of a condensed matter theorist, Sung Sik Lee, people found fascinating non-Fermi liquid behavior that relies strongly on this ADS2 quantum critical region. Uh, to get the, the various singular power law behaviors seen in two-point functions. Now, I, I want to stress here that this fascinating behavior that's been seen is what I would call 1 over n fascinating behavior, in that there's a quantum critical theory here, which scales with the leading large n, contains most of the degrees of freedom, and the responses that are of so, of so much interest, because they're non-Fermi liquid-like, are always subleading compared to that large n behavior. Okay, so this is in some sense a probe interacting with a very large uh, background quantum critical theory. So the next question we might ask is, what happens if we start to make life a little more generic? Let's take John's advice and add parameters or add both fields and parameters and see if this result is robust. So let's write down the simplest toy actions that have more than just the Einstein field and the Maxwell field. So the, the simplest extension that you might think of I think Gary will talk about the, the other simplest extension, which would be to add a charged scalar. We'll add a neutral scalar, a dilaton. 
So the Lagrangian you might write would be something like Einstein plus a, a kinetic term plus some gauge coupling that depends on the dilaton for the U1 field uh, and some potential, which I've separated out from the cosmological term. Now, very simple choices with just such an action yield qualitatively new near horizon geometries for charged black brains that start to incorporate more and more of the things that condensed matter physicists talk about, so I'm going to go through them as illustrative cases. So what's the simplest case? Well, I wrote here a dilaton dependent gauge coupling. That's why I'm calling it a dilaton. So let's just first set V to zero and see what we get. Well, in this case, you can actually find asymptotically ADS solutions uh, where the near horizon geometry uh, is actually an exact solution of the equations of motion. Uh, and at extremality, it, it takes this form. So instead of the ADS2 cross R2-like form where dx squared plus dy squared was independent of R, here the spatial coordinates are indeed uh, shrinking as you go to the horizon. And the coefficient with which they shrink is different from that of the temporal direction. There's a z that distinguishes the two. In addition, because you've turned on a charge, we're studying charged black holes, the dilaton coupling here in presence of a charge in F sources some kind of near horizon potential for the dilaton. So there's an attractor mechanism the dilaton runs. Here it runs logarithmically near the horizon. And by bad choice of typing, I, I call that W, but that should be R. So we find two new ingredients here. There's a dynamical critical exponent, Z, that tells you how time and space rescale differently as you go towards the horizon. There's a scale invariance. If you rescale time uh, to the zth power of your spatial rescaling. Uh, and there's also some constant k governing how the dilaton is running. And this solution runs to either weak or strong coupling very near the horizon if you have electric or magnetic charges in the black hole with the conventions that I used. Now, physically, even in this very simple case, this simple metric, there are several interesting differences from the riser nordstrom geometry. Okay, first of all, because of this factor of r squared in front of r2, there's vanishing entropy density at t equals zero, which is a big plus. Now, the metric also still exhibits a scaling, a scale invariance with some finite z. Um, the near horizon geometry of ADS Reisner Nordstrom, you might think you should recover when you take alpha here to zero. You do. Z scales like one over alpha. And in that limit, z goes to infinity. And the metric you get is indeed one where time rescales, but space does not. Now, on the other hand, this metric, or sorry, the full solution doesn't really correspond to that of a scale invariant fixed point because there's this pesky running scalar. Okay, so the dilaton breaks the scaling symmetry. Uh, if you want exactly scale invariant solutions with the same properties, you can find them as so solutions of slightly different low energy theories. But I will not be interested in those today. And I should point out that by techniques not so different from what Andreas discussed, even in these geometries, as opposed to ADS2, you can still obtain non-Fermi liquids, which have linear resistivity in their leading transport, by putting probe fermions, sorry, probe D brains in the background of this metric and studying the transport of their fermions, which was done by these authors. Okay, but again, the linear resistivity is not a prediction. There's a parameter, and as you vary the parameter, you vary the response. So now let's, let's enrich this scenario by adding back the potential V of phi. OK, clearly this would become a tedious exercise if I tried to write down solutions for arbitrary V. But something that turned out to be useful is to simply write solutions where V takes a simple scaling form itself very near the horizon, where the dominant term is just some exponential governed by some beta. So we have two parameters now, alpha in the gauge coupling and beta in the potential. And if this term dominates, you then find a more general class of homogeneous isotropic near horizon geometries. And now they're characterized by two critical exponents. One, the dynamical critical exponent that I already mentioned. And the second called the hyperscaling violation exponent that I think most of us weren't familiar with until about a year ago. So I'll call this theta. The resulting metrics have this form. Here you should think of this r variable as the one that in ADS would be zero at the boundary and infinity at the horizon. And you see that the powers of R here are shifted from the ADS values both by the dynamical scaling and by this theta, which in fact makes the whole metric uh, not of the Lifshitz type form, but conformal to it. So these metrics are not even scale invariant. They're conformal to metrics that have a scale invariance. 
And again, in all the cases that I've seen in the literature, they're supported by a running scalar field whose trajectory typically hits some extreme value, either very weak or very strong coupling for the U1 at the extremal horizon, which signals a breakdown of the low energy action that was used. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. But before expanding on that breakdown, which indicates that these are at most intermediate phases, uh, let's describe the most interesting features of these geometries. So first of all, the free energy density in the presence of hyperscaling violation uh, scales in a different way from what you'd guess based on naive dimensional analysis, where there's a length scale, say, set by the correlation length, and everything scales like the right power of that length scale. In a scale invariant field theory in D space dimensions, normally the free energy per unit volume is T to the D plus one. But these metrics instead will have horizons that if you go and compute the thermodynamic quantities the way Gibbons and Hawking taught you or whoever, uh, you'll find the free energy per unit volume scales as T to the D plus one minus theta, where theta is this hyperscaling violation exponent. So in many respects, the thermodynamics of the dual theory is such that each effective space dimension, each of the D dimensions, uh, counts less by theta over D. They're really D minus theta effective space dimensions. Now, those of you who are rightly confused by just naive dimensional analysis will know immediately that that means there's another scale in the problem, some high energy scale that hasn't decoupled, that must make up the powers. So for instance, in the case of a Fermi surface, which we started with, that scale would be the Fermi momentum, K Fermi. And you would make up all the powers that should have been there in the free energy by extra powers of K Fermi. Uh, notably, precisely when this theta is D minus one, which means that the theory is behaving as if it has one effective space dimension in this sense, uh, you get a specific heat that goes like T if Z is one and T to the one over Z if there's dynamical scaling. This was noticed by uh, Takinagi et al and expanded upon by Sachinev and his collaborators. And the interesting fact here is that this specific heat matches at leading large n, for the leading large n response, the scaling that you'd expect for a theory with a Fermi surface. Because in the presence of a Fermi surface, only the dimension transverse to the surface in momentum space really scales. Momenta along the surface cost very little energy. So the, mo the most interesting fact here is that this is a leading large n result. There's no probe, there's no one over n. Now here's a second interesting fact about the same metrics. Uh, there's a very interesting formulation of the computation of entanglement entropy due to Ryu and Takinagi. So remember when you compute an entanglement entropy, you take a state, you write, say the ground state, you write the density matrix, you divide space into two regions, A and B, you trace out either the A or B degrees of freedom, and then you compute the entropy of that density matrix, trace rho log rho. That's the entanglement between A and B. Ryu and Takinagi proposed that that's given in holography in the following way. You take the boundary, you draw the, say, circle dividing uh, the, the, the boundary into two regions A and B, and then the entanglement entropy is given by an elegant calculation of the area of a minimal surface gamma A, whose boundary is precisely this boundary between A and B. More precisely, it's the area of that minimal surface divided by 4G Newton. Now, there's an attempt to prove this formula by Forsaev that I'm told is flawed, so there's no proof of this formula, but there's, there's a host of indirect checks, including exact results in two dimensions and so forth, that this formula meets. So I'll take this as a true and correct formula. Now, typical phases of matter are expected to obey a UV cutoff dependent area law for the entanglement entropy. Why is that? Well, it's because we'd expect in a local field theory there are local degrees of freedom on both sides of this red dividing line that are entangled with one another, and as we shrink the cutoff epsilon, the area in units of epsilon would give the number of such degrees of freedom and hence the entanglement. Uh, but the holographic geometries here yield, in the case that this boundary is a circle, this, this region is a circle, uh, instead of L, they, re they yield an L log L. There's a logarithmic enhancement of the entanglement. Precisely in the case when theta is d minus one, which was the case that also gave the, the linear uh, specific heat. Now, that's promising because the sort of hallmark in abstract studies of condensed matter of the existence of a Fermi surface is an anomalous L log L scaling of the entanglement, which was computed in 2006 by various condensed matter theorists. So both the specific heat and the entanglement entropy show signs of some kind of surface uh, 
in, in momentum space in the leading large end theory of these hyperscaling metrics. Now, to be pessimistic, one of my colleagues, Hartnell, and a student at Stanford, have actually gone and looked for spectral weight at low energy but finite momenta in these geometries. And in the leading supergravity approximation, there is no such spectral weight. Okay, so if there is such spectral weight, it has to be a subleading effect not visible in supergravity. Such spectral weight would be expected, of course, at the Fermi surface. So the summary of this part of my talk is that while there's progress, I think a lot remains to be done to find a convincing putative large-end dual for a theory with a Fermi surface, Fermi liquid or not, uh, at leading order. And until then, we'll be in this situation where we're studying 1 over n tails uh, that are being wagged by an n leading dog that's quantum critical and has no analog in the real materials. OK, there's one more point I want to discuss in this homogeneous isotropic context before I move on, which is on something that I'm going to call infrared incompleteness. Normally, string theorists talk about the need for ultraviolet completions. But in this context, infrared comple completeness is, is a bigger worry. So many of the most interesting solutions we just discussed in section B are infrared incomplete due to the running scalar, which goes to extreme coupling at the horizon. Okay, it runs to either very strong or very weak coupling. And my claim is that either extreme is potentially problematic in real constructions. So strong coupling is problematic for obvious reasons. Uh, if you go to strong coupling, corrections to the action as powers of the coupling will change the solution. But weak coupling is also usually problematic because of what the dilaton means in full constructions. <laughs> so if we were doing literal string theory with phi being the string dilaton, you all know the fact that m string is another scale in the theory. It's what allows strings to regulate a lot of the things they regulate. And it's a factor of the string coupling times m Planck. So in a theory where G string is running and takes extreme weak values in some part of the space, a high energy scale in Einstein frame is coming down, and the string tower is becoming light. And this can show up in string solutions in unsuppressed higher curvature terms that correct the geometry. Now, often in consistent truncations, what I call the dilaton is not the string dilaton. It's a radion. It's the radius of some part of the sphere or whatever you know, Saki einstein space you're compactifying on. Then weak coupling in this sense isn't weak string coupling, it's large volume. But again, at large volume, you've ignored degrees of freedom that are becoming light in your consistent truncation because at large volume, the Kaluza-Klein tower comes down in mass. And in fact, black hole solutions, not black brains, uh, where such effects happen and the corrections are crucial and change the structure of the horizon, were understood about six or seven years ago by DeBolker, Kalash, and Maloney, uh, just in the context of BPS black holes in Calabi-Yau compactification. So such effects are important, they're real, and they've been seen to change horizons. Now, for magnetically charged black brains, which is the case where the dilaton was running to strong coupling, we can easily show, but this is not hard, um, so it shouldn't surprise you, that in at least toy models, the infrared co incompleteness is cured in the running dilaton solutions. Because all that happens in the effective action is you start adding corrections to the various functions like the gauge coupling function in powers of the dilaton, and they yield new attractor fixed points at the horizon. They yield places where the dilaton can be stabilized, and the geometry goes back to that of its Maxwell-Einstein cousin, namely ADS2. Okay, so here I've shown that in plots of various functions that appear in the metric, but all you should take from these plots is that there's a region where there's something like Lifshitz scaling, and then another region where there's, I actually got them backwards, where there's uh, ADS-like scaling and Lifshitz-like scaling. Okay, and you could look up the plots. Now, I should also say, since I've been mostly speaking in bottom-up language, that such metrics also arise in microscopic D-brain constructions. They've been discussed in a variety of papers. And by far the simplest example, you don't have to go anywhere complicated, is just the good old D2 brain that was studied by Itzaki et al. in 1998, which actually has, a, over a large range of values of energy at large GN, uh, a value of this hyperscaling violation exponent that's minus a third. So between these values of, of the u coordinate of the radial coordinate, g squared n to the 1 fifth and g squared n, which is a wide range at large tough coupling, uh, this metric is precisely of the form I was discussing. Now in this case, we have both IR incompleteness and UV incompleteness, and both are solved in the full theory. The strong coupling limit is, of course, 
in the infrared, the M2 brain CFT, you grow another dimension. It's a very dramatic phenomenon. And the UV incomplete weak coupling region actually weaves supergravity, but flows to the fixed point governed by two plus one dimensional super angles. So this is a great poster child for what goes wrong with these solutions in the UV and deep IR. Now I should say that even without the running dilaton, many of the kinds of solutions that show up in ADS-CMT, uh, especially these, these solutions with dynamical scaling, the Lifshitz horizons, uh, have a mystery. Even without the running dilaton, there are strong tidal forces at the extremal horizon. And so if I didn't have the excuse of the running dilaton, something would still have to happen in the deep infrared. I'm not going to talk about that here, but resolutions of, of how you should think of this and what really happens physically have been discussed by these authors recently. How many, how many minutes do I have? Great. Okay, so in the last five minutes, I'm going to move on to less symmetric horizons. So low temperature phases that are not homogeneous and isotropic, but ha that have translation and rotation breaking, are ubiquitous in condensed matter systems, charge, spin density waves, pneumatic phases, and so on. So again, let me abstract a question for black brain physics. Can we classify, starting at least coarsely, possible dual gravity horizons? Now, as a starting point for classification, because I'm weak, um, I'll just try to classify the most general homogeneous but anisotropic extremal black brain, brain geometries. And then, if you're braver, you can try to make things inhomogeneous, too. So here, by homogeneous, I do not mean that you have translation symmetries that commute with each other in the normal way. Okay, what I mean is that for a theory in D spatial dimensions, there should be some d-dimensional group action that relates each point to its neighbors in a small neighborhood. Uh, or more technically, there should be d-killing vectors whose commutators give rise to a Lie algebra, uh, and only the trivial such algebra where all the structure constants vanish gives the normal translations. So here's an example. Uh, imagine in our three-dimensional space, we had usual translation symmetries along two of the directions, say here, but along the third, the z-axis, you would have to translate as well as rotate to get a symmetry. Okay. In terms of killing vectors, you could represent that up to relabeling of coordinates by these three killing vectors. Here you're rotating in the 3-2 plane as you move along the one axis. Now, these killing vectors generate a homogeneous space in the sense that each point in an infinitesimal neighborhood can be transported to each other point. But the commutation relations define an algebra that is invariantly distinct from that of translations in R3. Okay, here's the algebra. Uh, and in fact, these generalized translations could weave invariant a vector order parameter whose expectation value would break normal translations. So if your vector order parameter V had these three components, then normal translations would not be a symmetry but the algebra I just gave would generate symmetries. Or in a picture, there's some order parameter that does this in space. It's helical, with this being the x1 axis and with a parameter being the pitch of the helix. Now, that's a trivial example. You can all visualize it. But in fact, for phases in three spatial dimensions, all possible algebras of this sort were classified. And in fact, they're almost textbook material. This is the Bianchi classification which is of great use in old-style theoretical cosmology for homogeneous anisotropic four-dimensional FRW-like cosmologies. So the basic mathematical structure is the following. For each of the nine equivalent algebras that Bianchi found up to rescaling and redefining generators, there are three invariant one forms, omega, left invariant under the isometries. And so a metric expressed in terms of these one forms with constant coefficients will automatically be invariant under the algebra. And in fact, the one forms satisfy relations that contain the structure constants of the relevant algebra. So you just have to find all the sets of omegas that satisfy these relations with the inequivalent Cs, and you can write out all the possible metrics. Okay, now in holography, this isn't exactly the question we're after. We really have an extra spatial dimension, and we have time. So to start with, I'll make the simplest assumptions, uh, which is we maintain near horizon symmetries under rescaling of time, maybe with some exponent as you move uh, in the radial direction, and with the radial direction decoupled from the other spatial dimensions. Okay, so then the most general near horizon metric is of this form. There's a scaling for time, the omegas give you the metric with some ma matrix eta ij, and there's some betas that determine the scaling of these omega directions. 
What's interesting here is that given the type, which is a discrete set, there's just a finite set of constants you have to solve for to get the scaling metric. So in fact, you can often reduce the equations you need to solve from differential equations to algebraic. OK, now I'm out of time, and so let me hurry. Uh, one can find solutions, in fact, in eight of the nine non-trivial types in three dimensions just by considering Einstein gravity coupled to one field, a massive vector, which is amazingly rich for such a simple system. And in fact, in this case, the equations do reduce to algebraic equations. <coughs> Seven of the types are, as far as we can tell, uh, new classes of black brain horizons that were not considered before. Close analogs of our Bianchi 7 solution, on the other hand, that helical thing I showed you, were found previously arising from instabilities of other holographic phases by Harvey and holographic QCD, by Oguri and collaborators, uh, and by Gauntlet and collaborators. Now, an important question is whether these metrics require you to put the field theory on a space whose topology is different from R3, or whether you can start with ADS5 with the field theory on R3 and flow to one of these in the infrared without a non-normalizable deformation to the metric. We think the latter is the case. We've only explicitly shown that for type 7 numerically, uh, but we're in the process of showing it for the rest. So let me close with what we're doing now. Uh, as I said, we're refining the classification of these horizons. The real algebraic structure is richer than what I indicated, uh, but I gave you a sketch. I think the thing that I'm most excited about is really some work I'm doing with condensed matter theorists at Stanford, where we're trying to import some of the lessons from ADS constructions directly back into field theory. Instead of using a geometry, we're directly studying some quantum critical bosonic systems coupled to a Fermi surface using the techniques of renormalization group at a Fermi surface. And I have to say that if you're looking for rich problems in field theory where the payoff to effort ratio might be very, very high, I think this is an excellent place to look. Uh, and finally, uh, with some students and postdocs at Stanford, we're trying to find general classes of black brain solutions in sort of flux vacuum on Calabi-Yau threefolds, whose main function will be to shed light on issues of micro microscopic interpretation, uh, both for the ADS2 entropy that I mentioned before and for some singularities that arise in these configurations that I also mentioned. So thank you for your attention. Questions? Could you just elaborate a little bit on the second paragraph there? Sure. Um, so, so th let me tell you what the, the current state of the art is in understanding of that subject. Uh, th there, there are two very natural quantum critical bosonic systems whose coupling to a Fermi surface one could easily be interested in. I think there are many more, but there are two that are, that are considered in the literature normally. They're those that arise in problems of antiferromagnetism and ferromagnetism. And in our language, they would correspond to taking a boson with either z equals 2 or z equals 3 and coupling it to a Fermi surface. What's typically done in the literature is that one determines the one-loop bosonic self-energy by drawing a boson loop with the fermion interaction from a Yukawa coupling coming off, correcting the boson loop. One finds that the, the resulting correction to the boson self-energy dominates at low frequency compared to the tree-level term. One typically then throws away the tree-level term, keeps the leading correction as the entire bosonic propagator, plugs back into the fermionic self-energy, and tries to find a self-consistent guess for the coupled equations. This has resulted in some, some very interesting conjectures about what, what the fixed point structure is in two plus one dimensions, but these conjectures are largely uncontrolled in the sense that the analysis proceeded along the lines I just told you, and um, there's no small parameter governing the loop expansion. And even adding large n for reasons that Sung Sik Lee explained to us a few years ago doesn't help. Lar large n does not solve the, the uncontrolled nature of the perturbation expansion. So I think there are techniques that could improve the analysis of even that simple model, the z equals three, ferromagnetic boson coupled to a Fermi surface. But I think once such techniques are developed, they could improve analysis of many, many other such models with just order one bosonic quantum critical fields coupled to a Fermi surface. And the new thing that's really required there is a development of renormalization group that correctly accounts for interactions of a Fermi surface with such a boson. So the part that you would be, the part you're just mentioning is purely field theory analysis. Purely field theory. But I should mention that there's a strong analogy with what we talked about before in the section on, for instance, non-Fermi liquids at, at subleading orders in 1 over n, in that there what's really happening is that there's a, a, a fermion self-energy for the fermion. They're coming from interaction with a large n quantum critical bath. 
And the main thing that the field theory should allow us to do, if we're clever enough, is get rid of the large N and stick in a bosonic quantum critical bath whose origin we understand better in real materials. Well, uh, it's, I don't know if it is a question or comment, uh, but you will decide. Uh, the, um, to, for ADS-CFT to make sense, uh, you need at least a uh, large N approximation uh, and also a strong coupling approximation to use uh, field theory uh, and of gravity. Now, with large N, uh, there are two different types of large N. You can have large N, large matrix N, like when you sum all planar diagrams. In this case, maybe it makes sense uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, use uh, string theory, which sums random surfaces, etc. There is also another large N uh, when you sum uh, bubble-like diagrams, vector-like. In this case, probably you have to use if. if if do it at all, you have to use uh, Vasiliev uh, gravity. Um, now, th th that's kind of a comment, but uh, this, the question is whether in some concrete uh, condensed matter system you have any of, uh, the, the thing I can think of is large M, vector large M uh, in many body systems. Are there some examples of matrix large N in many body systems. That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, uh, well, uh, whether there are any reasons uh, to approximate string theory by the low energy Lagrangian uh, in, in, in this situation. Uh, I'll try to answer briefly. So first of all, the system I discussed in answer to Edward's question when it's analyzed by condensed matter physicists is done in a vector-like large N limit, where N is the number of fermions. And I agree with you that in analyzing any vector-like large N theory, even if there is a gravity duel, the gravity duel is likely to be highly curved like Vasily of gravity. And I do not see a good reason to truncate to a low energy theory with a small number of fields like I did here. Uh, your second question was, are there places where I think the matrix-like large N could be useful? And actually, uh, one of the things that we're adding to what condensed matter theorists have done in some of these simple systems is uh, if you want enification of not just the fermion but the boson uh, in such a way that some set of diagrams is controllable not just using their normal technique, which is a, what I would call RPA, um, but also using this rainbow diagram approximation for bosonic loops. And I think they haven't exploited that as much as they might, uh, and it might actually be fruitful in some of the problems that they consider. <laughs> 